<laughs> All right, hello everybody and welcome to Lynn Casa. It's Sunday afternoon and so we're listening to some music. Uh, today we, I, Laura, <laughs> I don't, don't know why I'm talking about myself in the first person plural. I, Laura, am joined here by Jeremiah who has recently uh, shared his, his interest in the music of Elliot Smith with me and helped me to appreciate this artist that I've heard about for so many years and I have even listened to some of his music but have never really engaged with. So it's been a fun musical journey. And Jeremiah, my guide to Elliot Smith, tell, tell us a little bit about how you came upon his music. Okay, uh, you know, from, from an early age, uh, I've been into music. Mm -hmm. uh, fell in love with U2 when I was about five or six years old and heard Sunday Bloody Sunday. And uh, my, my taste kind of drifted left of the dial, so mm -hmm. to speak, in listening to more underground, more alternative uh, type of stuff, and as opposed to what was on pop radio. Yeah. Uh, and my introduction to Elliot Smith actually came uh, when I saw the movie Good Will Hunting. Mm -hmm. And I, I enjoyed the I music. I bet that's how a lot of people heard about him. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably what, what uh, you know, created him his fame uh, to rise as quickly as it did during that time period. Uh, but I, I enjoyed the movie and I was especially uh, captured by the music in it. And uh, you know, did, did a little looking, found out that Elliot Smith was primarily responsible for the music and he had released around that time uh, this, this album, uh, Either Or, which you know, provides the perfect introduction to his music. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would agree with that. This is the one that you first introduced, suggested that I get into, and it was a it was a good place to start. Yeah, because uh, it's it's really representative of his career, you know, both where he came from and then you know what what was to come in the future. Mm. Um, and really, what what I like about it, uh, you know, when I discovered it, I I was in my late teens. I was I, I want to say eighteen or nineteen years old and had outgrown the unreasonable, angry angst of, uh -huh. of being a white, middle-class, suburban teenager in the Midwest, uh, but was not arrogant enough to think that I had you know, figured this whole life thing out. Right. Uh, and I think the music of Elliot Smith really speaks to, to that, uh, you know, kind of wandering, uh, trying to find your place. I, I would agree. I have to say, I told you this earlier, so I'm repeating myself to you, but that I, I'd heard about Elliot Smith. I'd had friends who liked his music and, and I liked some similar music, but I just missed it when I was a, the, the age that you're talking about. And listening to it now, I found that the emotional, the way that he interacts with emotions, I think is the strongest element of his music. And it's also the weakest element. <laughs> like, I, I, I love his emo like his emotional transparency, and I think that 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 is something that was prevalent in a lot of the kind of grunge music at the time. But that that emotional transparency was covered with guitars and and attitude, and so with him, it comes across so honestly and so so honestly in terms of how complicated our emotions are and just admitting every feeling that someone's having but it is also petulant <laughs> you know it's, it's dead. there's no way around it and sometimes it, it yeah. and and that's even that is what there's beauty in that too because when you acknowledge all those feelings that you have not when you're only a kid but also when you're an adult um there's something really healthy about it and that just pulls you into yourself. But I bet, was he a great favorite of yours when you were growing up for that reason? Or is there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I still, you know, even 25 years later, uh, acknowledge that I haven't figured this whole life thing out. Right. Uh, and still find myself kind of wandering around and... Uh, you know, we, we have a tendency to kind of uh, process our emotions as opposed to just letting them out completely yeah. raw. Uh, and I mean, the, that's the thing to do in polite company. Uh, but at the same time, you know, in, in music, I, I like the raw, unprocessed, 
you know, more of a, a string of consciousness, mm -hmm. you know, here's everything that I'm going through without necessarily trying to solve it. Yeah. Uh, more acknowledging the question as opposed to trying to find an answer. Right. That's true. It, it, there's something about just admitting it. And there's a vulnerability in that too, because you're not solution seeking. Right. You're just, you're just dwelling in your feelings. I really, my probably my favorite of his songs that I've gotten into, which it, I don't think it's on, I get the albums all mixed up. Yeah, the Alameda. Mm -hmm. I think it's so beautiful, and I love that nobody broke your heart, you broke your own because you couldn't finish what you started or something like that. Is that, yeah. um, and finish what you, because you can't finish what you start, that's it. And that, is a line that really hurts and all of us do that where we feel like someone's done something to us but we've actually just done it to ourselves mm -hmm. because we're not capable or we're not ready or we you know we're not determined we you know but it's a mature song mm -hmm. but i think to admit that you have to have a little bit of um you have to be a little histrionic to admit it. I don't know. I don't know how to say that because I love it. I don't. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm giving him kind of a compliment. I'm not trying to shame him for his expression right. of feelings, but it's there's. It's a complicated person to be so honest, and I, I like that it makes me have complicated feelings about myself and about his music. It you can dwell in it a little bit. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And I think, I think that we as people have, have a tendency to want uh, closure and want completeness. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the sad part of it is a lot of times there's not that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't have a, a resolution. We just simply you know, move on. And I think that's one thing that I definitely appreciate about, appreciate about his music is that he's he's exploring not necessarily with a destination in mind but just kind of uh embracing the exploration of it right what's one one song that you think illustrates that because i feel that about his music too oh there there's so many uh, you know I'll, I'll pick one that that we listened to recently and that i listened to on the car on the way here uh but twilight off of the uh the posthumous release from basement on the hill um, you know, there's, it's, it's sort of, you know, a longing, uh, in the song without the definitive resolution of, you know, this is either going to happen or this is not, mm -hmm. uh, it's just sort of in, in the middle, yeah. you know, kind of wondering which direction, you know, with, it could go either way. And that is really, he's, he's pinpointed the hardest part mm -hmm. when you don't know what step is next. That's that, that's really a despair. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. That is the ultimate despair, not knowing where you're going or, or why. Um, yeah, it's that's really that's a good point. So we, we talked a little bit and I'm curious to hear you talk more about it, about so you got into either or and EXO. Yeah. And yeah. then figure eight came out. And uh -huh. that was a different record. Yeah, it, it was uh, very sonically different. Uh, both EXO and Either Or are you know almost folkish, a lot of acoustic guitar, uh, not heavily arranged. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Figure Eight came out, and the opening track on it uh, is you know almost that you know Phil Spector wall of sound kind of production. Yeah, and it was such a departure that it was you know frankly kind of hard to digest at first having you know listened to the other two albums um uh, you know and I, I it took me a while to even work my way through it uh you know it, it was probably on about the third or fourth listen that i got to i want to say the fourth track um uh, on it um uh, you know every everything reminds me of her uh which had a much more familiar feel mm -hmm. to it sonically uh, you know, lyrically, it's it's still emotionally dense. Uh, you know, still that whole exploration without resolution, uh, and that allowed me to, 
you know, get ankle deep in the waters of figure eight uh, to the point where I, I've started listening to it more and more. And over time, it's become one of my favorite albums of his. Yeah. So it's really, it's grown on you the most. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's, it, it is a departure, but it's, you know, sort of, sort of like an evolution for him. Uh, you know, the great artists who have, you know, withstood the test of time, be it, you know, the Beatles or U2 or, you know, any other band that's continued to reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, this is sort of him stepping out of, you know, the, that acoustic, you know, singer songwriter, folk artist shell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, stepping into a, a new phase of his career. I also wonder, you know, he, is coming out of that grunge background. And I think him being so different when he came out with his solo music, I wonder if there was a little hesitation to take on that bigger sound that was more associated with grunge <laughs> and what was, was popular. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it, when, when I think through, you know, the music of his career, I feel like, you know, he started out being really uh, intimate, mm -hmm. uh, and that you know lends itself well to you know essentially a with his voice being as soft spoken as it is, uh, you know the the acoustic guitar and the folky uh, style of music feels much more intimate than it does than the uh, than the big sound of you know heavy drums and a lot of electric guitars and things like that. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna complicate that a little bit maybe. So I think that the like when I listen to the first couple, Elliot Smith and Roman Candle, and and also a little bit either or and EXO, yeah, I'll put them in the same category. That I think that a little more what you're calling folky. I'm gonna take that too. That sound that it does create. A, a higher level of intimacy throughout the listening experience. Like it always feels really intimate. But I think that Figure Eight, and I would say also there's what, I don't remember which album has that song, Waltz Number Two, but I think I that think song does it too. I think that's actually yeah, on EXO. I love yeah. that song. But I think that that song and, and, and this album does it too, that they create, they lull you a little bit, or their music is a little bit happy or almost catchy and then when it lands a blow it really hurts like waltz to that you you know you're no good you're no good you're no good that is such a that's a simple set of lyrics but i think because of the swing of that waltz that to me just sounds like a smack <laughs> like it really who it's a wallop and i i i like that yeah, uh, but maybe I'm making it up. I don't know. What do you think? No, it's it's definitely there. And uh, we we talked earlier about uh, the song from Figure Eight uh, with uh, "You're Just Somebody That I Used to Know." Yeah, uh, where it's it's really kind of upbeat, uh, you know, sing songy music. Uh, but you know that that line, "You're just somebody that I used to know," it, it's it, it's especially bitter you know, underneath the layer of sweetness of the music. Yeah, be, because it is, it pulls you in and it it admits that there was sweetness. Yeah. Because I think that the earlier stuff is a little, it's got kind of one emotional note. It's a true one, not all of it, but it's, it's a true one. And the music is good, it's very good, but um, by allowing more to show, and, and using more instruments and bringing in, I, I think that he really reveals a growth as a musician. And uh, yeah, no, I, I, I like them a lot. I, the other thing, I've, I've been talking a lot, but I listened to a few of the really early songs that he wrote, like uh -huh. when he was really young. And someone was interviewing him and they asked him, you know, why don't you think these songs went big or whatever, you know, something like that. And he said, I don't know, probably because they're not very good. And he's so right. And it was, well, what killed me is you think about them in context of this is something that some high school kid's making. They were yeah. great. But in terms of actual songs that you want to listen to, and they sucked. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, they're not that good. And so 
I bring that up not to shame as a, as a child, but to say that I think he really does show a progression. Yeah. Musically, that's that's very that reveals an engaged artist. Yeah, and again, that that raw, brutal honesty. Mm. Yeah, which that, never <laughs> kind of never goes away from his music. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's a perfect response uh, that that I would expect out of him uh, yeah. to just admit. Yeah, they, they weren't that great. <laughs> they weren't that great. And it's the truth, you know. We, um, sometimes the truth is the funniest thing for someone to say. Because yeah. we don't expect yeah. just honesty. And uh, it, I mean, it's one of the things that we admire about kids. And, uh, and you know, I, I think that, you know, there are situations where it would be more appropriate uh -huh. as adults for us to be that raw and brutal. Right. Uh, in, in our honesty, uh -huh. uh, as opposed to, you know, dancing around the subject, just trying to be polite. Uh -huh. No, it's not. Uh, I have a couple. So I teach, I teach Latin, at, I teach seminary students. Uh -huh. And so I have a couple students who really value honesty. And I work with some people who really value honesty, but they also really value politeness. And I think that they're some of the most engaging people to, to talk to because they're not mean. They don't want to be mean, but they want all, but they want to say things that are true. Because a lot of the people that we associate with saying things that are true are mean. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> even Elliot Smith right. is a little mean. There, there's something about him that's um, that's cutting. Yeah. And I, which again makes it off-putting, but it also is real. He's not playing some Don Draper anti-hero character. He's just talking about human feelings and the ones that we all have. But he's, anyway. Um, so, do these really, what do you think your attachment, this might not even be a fair question, but do you think that you have an attachment to them, to these this music, because of what it meant to you in those different times of your life, or is it a musical relationship, or or both? Maybe that. I I honestly think it's both. Uh, yeah. You know, because while while we were planning this out, you know, I listened to Elliot Smith exclusively over the course of the past couple of weeks, and I think I you know mentioned in one of the messages back and forth that it's it's been a you know at least a strange emotional journey. Yeah. Because uh, one, you know the raw emotion of the music and, you know, conjuring up memories of, you know, I, I can remember having feelings, you know, associated with my life that gelled with the music the first time I heard it sure. and have, have had events and, you know, life happenings that, you know, I can still have that emotional connection to the music. Uh, and I think that, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about, the, the dark and depressing mm -hmm. aspects of it. Um, and, and I think that he specifically gets kind of pigeonholed mm -hmm. as that, you know, dark and brooding, depressing artist. Yeah. Uh, but I think that one thing that I really appreciate about it is, yes, he does have that unprocessed, raw emotion and covers a lot of dark and frankly ugly subjects, but turns them into something beautiful because uh, I mean his his song craft is just amazing uh, he's a brilliant you know lyricist he's a brilliant guitarist uh, and there's you know frankly something cover comforting mm -hmm. about the fragility and softness of his voice his voice is really it's beautiful it grew on me the first um, the first couple of listens I kind of ignored, not ignored, but I, I didn't really connect with his voice except for on that last, the Say Yes song. That, that, I, that one really got me. And then I had to listen more to appreciate kind of what you're saying, that he does have a lot of fragility in his voice. Mm -hmm. I think that, and I'm embarrassed almost to say that, but I think that, not that he has fragility, but what I'm about to say that I, I think that I interpreted in the first couple songs, um, like, 
maybe mistakes where I was really hearing emotions that there's some place mm -hmm. where it's a little bit off and I think that that's actually what it's supposed to be but that I was wanting him to be like a boy band which he's not <laughs> like he's not a he's not an artist with a sheen right and that that is the texture of his music and without without his voice kind of being sometimes not quite as pretty as you think it's going to be and sometimes not quite as ugly as you think it's going to be and that he he really utilizes what what he's got but also kind of keeps the song on edge a bit yeah and i think i think he's an artist that's very self-aware mm. uh in in terms of that where he he knows that he's not you know the the singer that's going to be you know justin timberlake uh, but at the same time, he's not doing the you know grungy growl uh, kind of thing. Yeah, he's he's just kind of you know here I am putting himself out there, mm -hmm. uh, and and again, completely unprocessed as far as it goes. So you know, there's you know he he does do a lot of vocal layering, especially on the later albums, uh, but it it doesn't sound as polished and overproduced as a lot of music that wants to highlight the vocals right. sounds. What would you, because you talked about um, re-listening to everything and, and had, you know, was there one song that you felt differently about? Either, you know, the music or the, you know, one song that you're like, I used to love this and now I don't, or vice versa, or? Well, I mean, there, there are several highlights that, you know, when I listened to them the first time, the way that I connected to them, mm -hmm. it's connecting to a different uh, event or, or something like that, uh, a different memory. Uh, you know, and that's, I, I think that's part of why I like his music so much is, yeah. it's, is it's so complex that, you know, listening to it, you know, as a 19 year old and listening to it now as a 45 year old I can still have that connection mm -hmm. uh, where, I mean, there's, there's a lot of music that I've listened to and I, I still like it, but the connection has kind of stayed pretty stagnant. Right. Um, where like I can, I can listen to a Duran Duran album mm -hmm. and, and I can remember how I felt the first time I listened to it. Yeah. But you know, that, that state, that anchor has stayed there. Uh, that connection has stayed there. It's not as fluid yeah. uh, as as it is with an artist. You like know, Ellie I gotta Smith. say that with Tori, like I um, I loved Tori Amos so much during a few years, like a few specific years. That I I I think I don't have anything to say against her as an artist. I think she's very very talented, but her music makes me feel so much like I'm. <laughs> 19 again yeah and then you're right it's like the anchor is stuck and i i can't get away from that feeling for myself i want to maybe one no i'm not i right now i can't i know that one day you know i'll i'll i'll, I'll mature <laughs> but there's still a part of me that has that that, that angsty 19 year old i'm like oh no it's stuck it's, <laughs> it's lodged <laughs> has happened to me i can't uh, i can't be myself now <laughs> when i hear two pianos playing yeah uh, but um <laughs> anyway so you recommended me starting with either or and then you kind of had your own you had a, a, a system of where how to attack elliot smith's uh -huh. music um do you do you think that he is an artist that someone can start listening to at any time or is it is it of that era no i th i think it's pretty universally uh applicable uh, i think that anyone could pick up an elliot smith album and listen to it and you know feel a connection to it uh, you know i i would not recommend elliot smith for passive listening yeah uh, it's it's not the kind of stuff that I would put on as background noise uh, or anything like that, especially you know the first time through. Uh, you know it's it. 
to, to really connect to it requires that active listening, like actually intently listening to it. Yeah, I told you. I listened to a couple of them the first time in my car and it was not right. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's definitely sit down and, and listen. Yeah, because, it, I mean, it's it's so complex both lyrically and musically uh, that there are you know, so many layers upon layers upon layers uh, that really to, to take it all in uh, requires some intention behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, it, and I mean, frankly, I think it's universally applicable. I don't think it, it, you have to be a particular type of person uh, to get into the music of Elliot Smith. I think, yeah. you know, it, it no, I would say that's fair because I, my, I'm going to admit my own uh, bias that because of a few people I knew that liked Elliot Smith, I just thought of his music as being like such a downer. I'm like, oh gosh, Elliot Smith, it's, I, I, it's going to be very emotionally weighing not, and not um, refreshing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't realize that it had as much catharsis and, and so I kind of avoided him for years and I shouldn't have because that that is kind of pigeonholing <laughs> him right. and, and thinking, no, no, only kids that like to wear black and paint their nails can listen to Elliot Smith. Right, it's, right. That's unfair. It's unfair. Just, okay. just the kids in dirty t-shirts and, <laughs> and right. ripped jeans that look down all the time. That is, everybody was looking down for like 15 with that hair. Yeah. And one, that's the other thing is that I, I would, I want to hear what you say about this. To me, Elliot Smith, I would not say that it's emo music, but all the emo music that was around when I was in college makes me think that that, that person liked his music. Is that? I, I think that's fair. Uh, you know, I... I wouldn't classify him as emo uh, in terms of the musical category, mm -hmm. but I think that again, the draw of you know the the category that that we now call emo is that you know raw emotional, uh, unprocessed you know more more seeking, mm -hmm. uh, and you know frankly embracing uh, being lost as opposed to trying to find the answers and trying to find your way out of the maze. Uh, so I think there's definitely that, that similarity between you know, the emo music uh, versus the music of Elliot Smith. Uh, so I think there's definitely, you know, if, if there's a Venn diagram mm -hmm. between Elliot Smith fans and emo fans, there's a significant overlap. Okay. Uh, but you know, again, I think that you know, his song craft in general you know, is, is so universally applicable that you know if if we're having a conversation about great musicians and great songwriters, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to mention you know Lennon and McCartney or Bob Dylan, I think that Elliot Smith definitely belongs in that conversation for mm -hmm. sure, uh, because you know basically anyone that I've I've ever met that I've introduced to Elliot Smith, they enjoy his music, yeah. uh, and and for different reasons. And different songs and, and all that. Uh, but I think that's kind of the, the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, we, we were talking earlier uh, that I think that a lot of times when we become fans of music, we try, we tend to overanalyze. Yeah. Uh, you know, and especially, you know, with, with the way Elliot's life uh, went and, and the way it ended, uh, you know, a lot of people tend to make assumptions and analyze that, oh, this song is about this really dark period in his life and things like mm -hmm. that. And, you know, I, I think it's, you know, frankly healthier uh, for us to realize that, you know, we don't necessarily need to analyze what it means from the artist's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that any honest artist would say, you know, if, if you asked them, what does this song mean? They would say, what does it mean to you? Because right. that's, that's what it means. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that there, like, if, if someone writes something and they want the world to know what it's about, they, you know, um, I'm sure you two has done this a lot. <laughs> if yeah. someone says, I, I, I'm making a statement about this political thing or this, um, this issue that's near and dear to my heart, 
And that's one thing. And they, they um, are making that statement and they're making a statement with, with that emotional, with that communicational um, foundation. But I think if a musician or an artist of any kind wants to make a statement and then walk away, we should let them. Because yeah. just because someone has something interesting to say or beautiful to say or whatever, it really doesn't mean that we have a right to know about their private life or that their private life is interesting or worth it. You know what I mean? Right. It's, we don't do that to other jobs. Like if I go into a boutique and I'm like, oh my gosh, this place is so well organized. Whoever picked out all these clothes has great style. You know, they really know how to make a display. This atmosphere is so engaging. I don't say, you know, I, I think that they should, they deserve, I, I deserve to know if this person, you know, has been divorced and what she thinks about yeah. and if she's ever had it. You know, it that's so inappropriate. Yeah. I mean, why do we do that to musicians and artists? Like, no, you, you've told me something, you have to tell me everything. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I think that would be an interesting experiment, though. Uh, I, I really love your store. Let me check out your house. Right. Yeah, <laughs> tell me about yourself. Yeah. Deeply. What did you eat for breakfast this morning? Right. Did you make this decision because your, you know, your husband never does the dishes or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> you're, what's you're what's right. your relationship with your parents like? <laughs> hey, and those people are also expressing themselves. I mean, they are. They're yeah. also saying, hey, this is what I think a business should be like. This is, these are items I think are beautiful. This is, you know, but. Yeah. And I mean, we, we unfortunately do that to artists where you know, we, we almost write off entertainment and, and entertainment through the arts as, you know, luxury and not a necessity. Yeah. Uh, but I think that, you know, throughout, you know, human history, music specifically has, has been prolific mm -hmm. as we've, you know, formed civilizations and things like that. And I think that art is a, a critical component. One of the old, uh, really old artifacts is like a flute. <laughs> yeah. Think about, wow, people couldn't do so much, but they couldn't make instruments. <laughs> yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, use music as a, a means of expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, you know, we, we live in an age now where it's so accessible to us, uh, where, you know, I, I carry around a small computer in my pocket where I can conjure just about any song yeah. at any moment and, and listen to it. Uh, and I think that, you know, just being able to appreciate art for art's sake without overanalyzing and without, you know, diving too deep into mm -hmm. someone's personal life, I think that would be a, a wonderful thing for us to be able yeah. to acknowledge well and also for us too because we don't have to like we can if we want to talk about people you know we've got sisters and brothers and friends you know we got plenty of people to talk about and we know those people so it's more interesting but if we want to talk about ideas let's talk about ideas and right. yeah um but i um i do think that you are right, that he's someone who has something to say to everybody. Mm -hmm. Be that his his music is varied enough and interesting enough. What? So my favorite song, I, I've said a couple, like I love Almeida, I like Say Yes a lot. Waltz number two is probably my, it, is there one song that you think hits you the hardest or you, do you just have so many? I, I think it really depends on the day. Uh, Between the Bars is one that I, I could probably always listen to and you know get that sort of you know feeling in my gut um mm -hmm. uh, you know uh from from the uh from a basement on the hill album twilight is one that that's that way yeah. uh, where i can i can listen to it all the time and always you know feel some emotional connection to it uh some of the ones that you've mentioned uh with you know say yes uh definitely one of my favorite tunes and I mean, there there are so many in his catalog, but uh, those those would be the highlights. And you know, one one that we've listened to extensively today is Miss Misery. Yeah, that's a great song. I so you pointed out to we you we listened to an earlier version and we listened to the later version, and you pointed out how the chorus changed. And 
hearing it in a different version made me appreciate how how beautifully written that chorus is. You miss me, miss me, miss me, like you say. Because that, again, he's hit on a very specific feeling of that fear that someone doesn't really miss you. Mm -hmm. And the idea that they mean something, they mean more to you than you mean to them. And there's a deep dejection in that. And yeah. the earlier chorus, what was it? It was more uplifting. Yeah, the, yeah, the earlier chorus is much more optimistic, uh, where it's instead of, do you miss me, miss misery, like you say you do, uh, the chorus is, it, but it's all right, because some enchanted night I'll be with you. It, which is and it, so different. And it, it's so out of character for, you know, what, what people typically think of Elliot Smith. Uh, and, you know, again, it's... It's the same song either way, uh, but there there are days when I much prefer the early version, yeah. And there are days when I much prefer the uh, what was essentially the final cut that uh, that made the soundtrack and and was nominated for the Oscar for Good Will Hunting. I think that the the final version is much more remember much more um, memorable mm -hmm. because it. It hits so hard and the music is so pretty. Yeah. That it it is kind of a one two punch that it feels like it feels like he's saying what he's saying with absolute clarity. That that's the root of it. Like not he's not freaking out about do you miss me? I'm I'm able to put it in this light because I've really thought about this and I don't think you do. Where the the earlier version, I think you're right that it, it's very successful as a song. It's very successful as a song, and mm -hmm. it's it's certainly sweeter. I might even like it better, <laughs> but I don't think it's more memorable. It, but it... yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think you know there's there's a reason why uh, the version that's more prevalent is is the one that's more prevalent. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's definite reason why it was the one chosen. Uh, of the two versions. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, I still think, you know, there's that lesson to be learned that, you know, both kind of have that same longing. Mm -hmm. One side of the coin is, you know, the late version where he's kind of pessimistic about it. Yeah. You know, do you really miss me the way you right. say you do? And and the other one is you know, I'm still holding out hope. Yeah, maybe, maybe for, it's gonna happen for you. And you're yeah. right. There's even something kind of there's pessimistic, but also a little mean. Of like, do you miss me the way you say you do? Yeah. Like, you're is she saying is she lying or is she telling other people like to get sympathy? Like, oh, oh, I miss him so much. Right. Yeah. yeah. But either way is pessimistic and and. Um, well, I mean, the opening line of the song, either version is, I'll fake it through the day with some help from Johnny Walker Red. Yeah. So, you know, it, it already starts on kind of a down note, but, you know, the, the early version has that little uplift of, you know, maybe there's a glimmer of hope. Yeah. Even though we're talking about that song and saying, you know, it's more pessimistic, it, that I don't know that that necessarily has to mean that that's an emotional choice. I think that the, could, could also just be a musical choice of what what works better in the song and for the yeah. movie that it was a part of and you know there's a lot of decisions that that can go into that uh that you're right they'll fake it through the day <laughs> even just the idea of you're faking it through the day right. the, the whiskey makes it you know it adds a, an element but faking it through the day mm -hmm. everybody's done it nobody wants to do it yeah we all know and, and it, it can mean something different because there's people who faking it through the day because they have to be happier than they actually are, and then there's people that just don't want to do it at all, <laughs> you know? Right. But, but we all relate to the feeling, maybe on a different level, but we all relate to it some way or another. Has there been a time in your life when you've stepped away from the music of Elliot Smith? Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he's always going to be a favorite of mine, uh, but there, you know, I, I think the longest that I've been without listening to him, you know, on a heavy rotation basis, it, uh, 
there have been a couple of years uh, between me, you know, really being involved. Okay, uh, so sometimes music. you do step away. Yeah, yeah, and that, I mean, I, I I tend to, you know, immerse myself in whatever you know mood I'm in at the time. So. Mm -hmm. There'll be a, a, a time that I discover a new artist, you know, kind of like I did with Elliot Smith. You know, when I first came across his music, I picked up the most recent released album, and then I kind of went backwards, mm -hmm. picking up all of his previous albums, even going back into the you know, days of his old band Heat Miser, and checking out their stuff. Uh, you know, I, I do the same thing with other artists today. So, you know, the past two weeks I've been reimmersing myself. And Elliot Smith, mm -hmm. just to prepare for this conversation, but you know, I've I've listened to some newer artists and kind of done that same deep dive. Right, where you? Uh, yeah, into listening to their entire catalog and just kind of listening to them, you know, on a more or less exclusive basis. Who are who's your art artist right now? Do you have one? I, I well, before I We're get right into this, this <laughs> before doing this. Smith, but... I, I had really been listening to a lot of Manchester Orchestra. Right. I love that. I only see, we can compare how we listen. I'm a slow listener too. And I have gotten into that Million Mass of God album. Oh, yeah. I love it, but I'm just not ready to move on. I said the same thing to Riley, that Bunny Light Horseman. I love that first album and I'm just not ready to take on the second one yet. <laughs> But I've heard that they have other albums that are really good, too. Yeah, uh, and I, I can't recall the name of the album, but uh, the song that drew me into it is called The Silence. Uh, and it's, if, if you need to move on from the million masks of God, yeah, that's your gateway. That's the way to do yeah. it? Okay, uh, I'll search it out. I just, God, I love that album. And that's one, Brian just started listening to it. He's been into him. He's listened to him for a long time, but I've never... Like, it's been something he listens to kind of on his own. I don't know why, but it just has worked out that way. But that album, he just got into all of a sudden, and it was on repeat. And I would, it was one that I would hear it, and I'd, like, walk into the next room and be like, okay, all right. And I, I it's so, it's so good. It's big. Yeah. And it's anthemic. It's got some, it's kind of whirling in a way. Like it, I, it yeah. makes me feel like I'm in the middle of the universe. Yeah. And I mean, the, <laughs> the music, uh, for, for lack of a better way to describe it, has a certain sense of urgency to it. Yeah. Uh, where you're, you're in the middle of it and you feel like you, you've got to do something, but you're not exactly sure what. Uh-huh. Wow. It's, it, it's a very consuming album. It's very consuming. I, I. I really think they, they hit it out of the park with that one. But okay, so that's something you listen to now. So Elliot Smith, you, you've had a long relationship with him. Oh yeah. Are there other artists that you have stayed with for so many years? Yeah, um, I mean U2 is one of those where they, they were sort of my- and That's my your first, five, right? Yeah, <laughs> my, my first love of music. Uh, so I've, I've stuck with them ever since and you know, through all of their various evolutions, mm -hmm. you know, through... And they've been through a lot, really. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, they they almost have devised a plan to release albums in trilogies, where you had their first three albums were sort of the, you know, almost new wave punkish. Mm -hmm. And then you had the, the next three albums, the uh, the Unforgettable Fire and the Joshua Tree, and I'll, I'll consider Rattle and Hum an album as opposed to a, a concert or live album, where they were essentially taking what they had learned and running it through the filter of American roots music. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you had them depart from that and go into their electronic phase. Yeah, like Octoon and, yeah. and you know, Zuropa and you know, Pop. And then sort of, you know, coming back to it with all that you can't leave behind and so on and so forth. Uh, and, you know, like with any change, you know, kind of like with, you know, moving on to figure eight with Elliot Smith, it was hard for me to get out of my comfort zone of what was familiar. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like U2's pop album, for example, when it first came out, it was such a departure from even, you know, what I had been listening to of theirs before mm -hmm. that I kind of didn't like it at first, but, you know, gave it some time 
you know, kind of like a, a swimming pool in the summer. Initially, <laughs> that, that shock of the cold water is awful. It's not pleasant. But the more time you spend there, the better it feels. Right. Okay. No, I, I get that. And I think that, I think it's, it's cool for artists to do that because you do it's just throw a bucket of water on you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. This, this, Wash is, it off. this is who we are now. Yeah. It's what we're doing now. And, and that's it. That's yeah. what we're doing. And, and maybe, maybe we'll do something different. Maybe this is just the way we're going now. Yeah. Uh, Pearl Jam is another one of those artists that, that I've, I've been with them since the beginning and mm -hmm. they've, you know, again, evolved over time and I still enjoy their music. Yeah, we've gone with them. I think probably the artist I've listened to consistently is Andrew Bird. Yeah. I really liked him in college and then and he's one I keep coming around to that I really liked him for, you know, a certain amount of time when I was in college and then I, when I was in graduate, I really liked him and then, you know, maybe three years later I really got into it. And so sometimes he has albums that miss me or I miss them and then I'll, you know, I come back, come back around to it. And I like, it's a comforting thing to say, oh, I wonder what this person's gonna do next. Stormy is another one. I wonder what's gonna come out next. I, I can't, I can't wait. Yeah. Uh, so it's good to, you know, yeah, Pearl Jam is that they're a band that would be fun to go along with. U2, of course, is so big, mm -hmm. but they, I think they've handled that level of fame. Yeah, I think that, you know, they've, they've got the appropriate balance of, you know, bombast. Uh, That's great. To, to be able to, to accept the level of fame and, and not just accept it, but embrace it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and on the flip side of that, there are so many artists that are kind of thrust onto that big stage and, and don't handle it well. I wonder if, because some of the, like, some of I can, so some of the artists that I really like that have done well over years together, U2, Radiohead, mm -hmm. Brian, if Brian were here, he'd throw in Coldplay, um, and I, I actually I like some of their music too, and um, I'm trying to think of another example, but they are bands, and so they've had each other, mm -hmm. and I wonder if that just makes it a little bit easier to have a <laughs> group of people where as opposed to being just one you know yeah and I think I think in many ways that being in a band is sort of like being in a family yeah. uh, where you know I've, I've got brothers and sisters or a brother and sisters and you know we we don't always get along you know there's there's those fights but at the end of the day we're all still family and I think that you know the camaraderie uh, with those bands that have endured long term, they kind of have that same dynamic going on. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I think you're right, and it, because there's something stabilizing about that. Because it's not just you. You're you've got people that you're around because you like them, and you know it's an easy relationship. But if you also have some people that you just know are there that you can kind of count on yeah. as a family, um, then I think it allows you to be yourself because you trust that the relationship can grow and change even if it's uncomfortable Yeah. in, 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 in parts. But, so do you have any kind of final thoughts and feelings on Elliot Smith? Something that you think people need to appreciate in order to really dive into his music? Yeah, I think just approaching it from the standpoint that you know there's there's a lot of uncomfortable emotion in it, mm -hmm. but it's 100% relatable. Uh, and I think I think that, like I said earlier, anyone uh, can you know reach out and listen to Elliot Smith and have some sort of connection. And what I truly appreciate the most about him is, you know, he does have that completely raw, unfiltered, unprocessed emotion, and then wraps it in this layer of absolutely beautiful music. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow, but it's got that nice, you know, coating uh, yeah. to help it go down. Huh. I, love, I like that. That's a good metaphor. It's something that you're, <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> All right. Well, thank you for being my my Elliot Smith guide. I do. I think there's some music I'll come back to and some that I won't. But I have definitely enjoyed diving in uh, to to his music and letting it be my music for three weeks. Because I've kind of done the same thing where I've said, "All right, we're just listening to Elliot Smith." these three weeks and um normally I've, I've got a few things i'm listening to so giving someone so much space was a, a really i wouldn't say fun is the right word for him <laughs> but it was a really um it was invigorating in a way yeah it was invigorating because he, he there's that that sense of just falling into someone's thoughts and feelings and letting them take up some space in your own brain that yeah. uh, helps you get back to yourself and I don't know, I, I enjoyed it. Um, well, once again, thank you so much for coming to talk about Elliot Smith. This has been um, a really, a really fun musical journey and we'll let you have the last word. Is there the last thing that you think that you have taken away from your three weeks with Elliot Smith? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, like I said before, it's, it's been an interesting emotional journey, uh, you know, from, from listening to songs that I first heard when I was, you know, in my late teens and being able to re-relate to them, you know, now that I've, you know, by all legal definition, an adult. Right. <laughs> <laughs> De definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Uh, you know, being able to relate to them, you know, in a similar way, but with a, a different connection, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to, you know, like, like stuff that's kind of anchored in, you know, the first time that I listened to it, the first connection that I had. Uh, you know, my, my relationship with the music of Elliot Smith has evolved over time. Uh, and I think that that is one of the reasons why I'm able to stick with it yeah. on, on a more consistent basis, as opposed to, you know, I mentioned Duran Duran earlier. They're my French fries. You know, there, there are days when I want to, you know, think about when I was eight years old and, and listen to Hungry Like the Wolf for the first time. That is a good song. Uh, you know, but I, I can't really have a, an evolved connection to that song the same way that I could, you know, Miss Misery for example. Uh, so I think that's, that's one thing that draws me to it is that, you know, times change and, and, you know, I've changed, but I can still go back to the music of Elliot Smith and, and have a connection, even a brand new connection to a very familiar song. Yeah. Good. Well, that, that's, that's, that's a strong recommendation for a musical artist, I would say. So thank you very much, Jeremiah, and thank you to everybody for listening. Uh, if you've got any suggestions of what we should listen to next, let us know. Happy listening! <laughs>